All right, thanks a lot for being with us tonight. Kind of a special edition of the Line of Sports Network podcast. Kind of some breaking news hit the Line Nation tonight. Southeastern offensive coordinator Greg Stevens has left the program. He is headed to Utah Tech, the Trailblazers football program. This is formerly Dixie State out in Utah that has changed their name to the Utah Tech in the last couple of years. They're a member of the Western Athletic Conference, and uh, he is heading there to be the offensive coordinator uh, for the Trailblazers. Mark Willoughby, Alan Waddell joining us here late night tonight to talk about this one. Uh, big break in news, guys, for Coach Stevens. Uh, now, he is originally from the state of Utah um, and has family there. He has grandchildren there. So he uh, kind of a good move for him to, to, to head back out there a little bit, but certainly a lateral move for Coach Stevens. Um, uh, not something you want to see. You, you thought you might lose him to an FBS program over – you know, Delta, uh, I keep saying Dixie State. I want to say Dixie State, but he thought you would have lost him to an FBS program over Utah Tech at this point. But, um, you know, he is heading out there. One of the most, the best assistants Southeastern has ever had, especially since the program's come back in terms of, and that's saying a lot. I mean, in terms of his productivity, because you've had guys like Pete Golding here. You've had guys like Carl Scott here. Uh, you've had guys like EK Franks here. You have guys uh, uh, that are all over college football, Patrick Tony. Um, so he's had incredible success here with this lineup, line offense. He has um, uh, led this team to two conference titles. I think he's been to the playoffs with Southeastern with both the head coaching stints with Coach Robertson and Coach Self. So I think he's made it four or five times in his in his time here. So um, tough loss for this program, guys, real tough loss. Um, Coach Self and him have been a great combination since he's been here in 2018 together. Remember, Coach Stevens came back to Southeastern and was hired by Ron Roberts um, to be the offensive coordinator in January of 2018. Coach Roberts would go to UL Lafayette in uh, in late or early February, late January. I guess he made the transition to go to UL as a defensive coordinator. Coach Stevens stayed behind and stayed with Coach Selfo, and they've had a, uh, a really great run of offensive football. And the quarterbacks that Coach Stevens has put out, it's pretty impressive. Uh, Brian Bennett, uh, when his – First stint here, you go back to the, the the second stint. You've had Cole Kelly, Chase and Virgil, um, Cephas Johnson. So um, very impressive, guys. It's going to be a tough one to lose, but you wish Coach Stevens all the best. Mark, uh, your thoughts right now, kind of well, taking this all in by minute by minute. Well, it's a, it's a huge loss for Southeastern and a, and a big uh, win for Utah Tech, no question about it. Greg Stevens, as you mentioned, uh, certainly – just from a track record standpoint, the most accomplished assistant uh, coach probably in Southeastern history, I think. Uh, I mean, you go got to probably go back to the 50s and 60s yeah, under a different era, Stan, Stan Galloway. But in recent memory, especially since football's been brought back, I mean, no question. Um, you know, the skin's on the wall that Greg Stevens has been able to hang offensively, not only, you know, from a production standpoint, but able to develop quarterbacks and develop an offense that averaged 38 points under Brian Bennett. Um you know, 36, 37 points uh, in 2019, 38 points in uh, 2020, up to 45 points in 2021 under Cole Kelly. And, um, you know, this year was a little bit of a step back, you know, transition with, uh, you know, changing quarterbacks and uh, Eli Sawyer having some injuries and um, just uh, some loss of personnel to the portal. And this was certainly a challenging year, but just collectively the job that Greg Stevens has done in two separate stints, by the way, it's, it's not very common that an offensive coordinator leaves and comes back and has success in both stints. So uh, it's, it's a big loss for Southeastern, no question about it. Alan, I know you followed Coach Stevens uh, just like we have since he came here in 2012 from Delta State with Coach, Coach Ron Roberts. Um, Coach uh, Stevens is a guy that has been able to – um, change with the time of football. I think college football has changed since, you know, he, he was here the first time and uh, he's had some prolific offenses, developed some great quarterbacks and um, uh, tough to see him go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't think very often that we would jump on here and want to do, you know, podcasts or whatever uh, about many assistant coaches, whatever they move on. But this is, this is certainly a uh, big news uh, that's going to really kind of shake Southeastern football in my opinion. And, um, you know, forget football for a second. Greg Stevens is an outstanding human being. Um, you know, just a tremendous man. His wife, Amy, uh, they've really kind of um, – they've been a they've been a, a big uh, asset to our community here. 
Hammond and but like you said it Robbie you know they're from that area they're from Utah uh, they have their family out there so certainly happy for them and their family they're gonna have an opportunity to go back out there but you know on the field for us I think that jumps out about coach Stevens and one thing that um, that we're certainly gonna have to replace is his ability to develop quarterbacks uh, and what he's been able to do and you talk about different guys with different skills and how he's made all of those guys really play well. You know, you look back over the last 10 years, uh, when Coach Stevens has been here, we've had really good quarterback play. When he hasn't, we have not had great quarterback play. Just call it like it is. I mean, he's done a really good job uh, of developing those quarterbacks and always having kids offense. And, you know, I've made comments before, but, you know, I've always thought we should have had a sign in the stadium that says, welcome to the greatest show on turf, because, you know, the last several years, uh, we've had one of the best offenses, not all in commerce, but in the country in FCS football, staple of being consistent and being able to do it in multiple ways. You think years where, you know, Cole Kelly was throwing it times a game, and then the next year with Cephas and Eli, you kind of adapt that thing, and, and you run the football. You go back to Brian, what he did. Um, you know, in, in that first stint in 2012 and 2013, he had Nathan Stanley, a true pocket quarterback who had really struggled in his college career, really brought him uh, to, to play the best college played in his last year, his only year with Coach Griffin. And then the next year with Brian Bennett, a guy with a totally different skill set, a guy that can run the football, uh, was able to do that and adapt. So, look, this is a big blow. Uh, not very often do you get a, a guy that's a coordinator of his caliber that's been with us as long as he's been. And, and like Mark said, was here, went to Eastern Illinois, and then came back. Um, and, and, you know, for Coach Greg Stevens, you know, his, his step in Eastern Illinois didn't go as planned. Uh, they had some injuries up there, and obviously he was battling were having cancer a little... when he went there as well. So he was able to defeat. But his bit had been right here in hand. A little bit of technical difficulty with Allen's uh, feed, but uh, I think we got the gist of it, Allen. You know, he left, went to Eastern Illinois, battled cancer, and uh, he had some really good, a uh, couple of really good seasons following Jimmy Garoppolo there. Cause he, I think he, he took over the year after when he left here, but you know, we, you know, Robbie mentioned Utah Tech, a lateral move. Eastern Washington was a lateral move. And I think in both cases, you know, I, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, he necessarily wanted to leave <laughs> uh, Hammond. I know him and his wife, Amy, uh, liked it, love it here. And, um, but uh, again, just a, a tough loss uh, all the way around, not only developing quarterbacks, we talked about that, but um, he's been able to develop weapons, you know, take guys that nobody wanted. I mean, let's, let's face it. I mean, they've had a lot of walk-ons and guys with no offers come in. He's able to distribute the football around guys like Austin Mitchell, made him a household name here. Uh, CJ Turner, obviously, uh, you know, up the record charts Mark. here. Yeah. Mark, another thing, he's, he's a sneaky, really, he's a really good recruiter. A very <laughs> he's brought good recruiter, in some, yeah. big, had some, had some contacts all over the country. You know, well, Chase and Virgil, uh, you know, obviously before that, Brian Bennett, uh, he's able to get those guys here and, you know, um, you know, some offensive linemen, uh, it, it's just, um, it's a tough, a tough loss, but, you know, again, we, you know, we're in a situation where, you know, and, I, and he, but, and he uses the tight end mark and, and you've seen that here. I mean, you don't see that a whole lot in college football anymore, but coach Stevens has implemented the tight end. You've seen huge success from guys like Branson Schwabel, in his second stint here, you go back to the first stint, guys like Jeremy Myers, um, who who were just, you know, uh, Taylor Jenkins, uh, guys who were really good tight ends in this organization. Then you had Nolan Gibbons, you had Ivan Jaboski, you had Bauer Sharp this year who's going to go into the FBS in the transfer portal. Um, a, a lot of really good players in that. Uh, guys kind of reading here, uh, I'm just logging on and seeing here. There is a, uh, it's already kind of hit the lineup fans board here. As, uh, fans are talking about that right now on lineup fans. Um, so, uh, I'm sure that will continue to, uh, build, um, just kind of reading a few posts have come up already about this. So it's obviously hit Twitter. It's hit lineupfans.com tonight. And so we're talking about it as well. So, uh, a lot of chatter will be coming in the new year for line fans uh, about this situation. You know, uh, it, we've seen a lot of great things out of coach Stevens. I think his best job was that he did was the 2022 season. I mean, you, you, re you replaced this legend in uh, Cole Kelly for two seasons. Um, and you, you had to kind of start over with what you wanted to do offensively. And you had 
Cephas Johnson, who who wasn't a great thrower, but it was an incredible athlete in the, in the quarterback game. And you had a young quarterback in Eli Sawyer. And he used both those guys that both battled injury at different times to get the most out of the offense and lead that team to a conference title. Um, you know, when you have guys like Chase and Virgil, you have guys like Cole Kelly, it's easier. But when you have guys that you got to develop and you got to build game plans around to match their success, a young and experienced quarterback like Eli last year, and, a, and at the same time, a guy who uh, – has some has some deficiencies in the passing game in Cephas Johnson, but he got the most out of those guys. And here's here's another thing is I don't think that he get enough credit in terms of how he handled for basically two separate years, 2019 and 2022. And you saw what happened this year, but the way he handled it at 19 and 22 with the ability to rotate those quarterbacks seamlessly for success. I think it's just unbelievable because, I mean, you always say the old adage, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. Well, Southeastern had some incredible offensive success rotating two guys in and getting the most out of those two guys in Chase and Virgil and Cole Kelly in 2019 and last year in Cephas Johnson and Eli. So I really don't put the 2020 year. Cephas didn't really get enough action to really inter- – Cole was Cole's show for two I mean, years. Cole, but yeah. Cole that was really impressive to me. Yeah, that was really well, impressive to me how he did it in those two seasons. Well, well, guys, you know, but the big question now is, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, is this a situation where, you know, we elevate from within as the offensive coordinator? Because, look, look, I'll, I'll say this as well, you know, and we've talked a lot about Greg, and Greg's obviously been tremendous here at Southeastern. You know, we always – we all feel, you know, very strongly about him and the job he did here at Southeastern. But I do think that his offense grew uh, working with Coach Self. I mean, I, I do think that there were some elements that were added to the offense, and he grew as a coordinator as well under Coach Selfo. So, I mean, obviously this is a man that knows what's going on with, on the offensive side of the football as well. But I think this is a big hire. You know, what do you do? Do you elevate from within? Do you bring a, a fresh perspective from the outside? I think there's a lot of question marks. Uh, and, and this is kind of the time of the year when, when coaches start moving around a little bit. Uh, you know, it's after the, the portal and, you know, or, or the portal's going on. And, uh, like in, in the FBS level, you have some, you have some, uh, you have the uh, the bowl games ending, and you're going to start seeing some dominoes fall. So, what do you do here, guys? I mean, wh- what do we do as uh, from an offensive coordinator perspective? If yeah, do we play from well, within, or do, or do we go out there and hire from outside? Well, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Does Coach Selfo call the plays? I mean, that's a, certainly a possibility. He's been a play caller for a lot of his career, whether it be at Louisiana Tech, Tulane, uh, UTSA. So, does he take that role on and start calling plays in 2000? And 24, I think uh, there's a, there's guys on the offensive staff that I think can be looked at. I mean, A.J. Hop's a guy who's been the offensive line coach. Does he want to make a transition to uh, the quarterback position and and, and and call plays? You know, that, that could be an option. Uh, Ross Jenkins, I don't know if, if he would want to do that or be looked at for that. He's a tight ends coach, but a former quarterback at Louisiana Tech. So, Mark, go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, if you elevate from within, obviously you're going to elevate somebody who has not had experience calling plays. Um, you know, so that's something you got to consider, obviously, you know, uh, obviously Frank Selfo has, has a, a ton of experience calling place. That may be a, a direction he goes, but you know, he's got so many connections around, you know, college and pro football that there's going to be somebody out there that's accomplished that, uh, he may be able to lure here to Hammond, but it's a critical hire. No question about it, because, you know, again, you're coming off of, you know, a tough year, three and eight, which was a. Yeah, a, a big setback for this program, which was expected to do well, and you know against a schedule that wasn't very tough. Let's, let's call it like it is. So you know, just an underachieving season. You know, so next year is going to be huge, especially with you know the gauntlet. Guess- you're going to yeah, m- a much tougher schedule. I mean, probably the toughest schedule, toughest start uh, the southeastern program has faced since coming back. So it's a critical hire. And uh, but again, like I said, Frank Selfo knows offense, and you know that's his background. So I. I I feel comfortable that he'll he'll solve it, um, you know. But again, it's just it, it, really it's more of the shock of you know, just not having Greg Stevens around. He's been here so long and six years in his second stint, and you know, there's something to be said about you know six years in one place. It's time to move on, especially if you're a guy with that kind of success level. So you know, we certainly wish you know Greg Stevens all the success in the world. It just kind of you know, again, just takes everybody by. You know, by shock, it shouldn't. I mean, it's it's college football, and it's the way it goes. And this program's had turnover before, but you know, again, it's someone that especially where he's going. You know, he's yeah. going back home, right? Yeah, he's home. yeah, he's going home. So from that standpoint, it's it's not you know not that big of a shock. 
Yeah, I'm shocked it is. So I know I know he's from Utah, but I think Coach Stevens is young enough and has had enough success. My shock is where he went. Um, I think yeah, he'll get I, the most out of Utah Tech, but uh, that's a bad program. I think, like, in 2022, they might have, like, won one game, Mark. Uh, yeah. I think they did a little bit better well, in 2023. Well, I think one thing you have but, to uh, step back but here I, a little I think bit. They're trying to in, I think they're trying to invest and build that program up. But, I mean, Utah real quickly Tech before was, I go back to you, Mark, is you talk about the higher – Southeastern, if you just look at the numbers, they pay about as good as anybody in the Southland Conference for coordinator positions. So uh, they're going to have an opportunity if they want to continue that pay grade to go out and hire someone, I think, pretty good. Yeah, well, stepping back to Utah Tech just real quickly, this is a program that was a junior college just a few years ago. They moved up uh, to D2, then to D1, had a name change from Dixie State to Utah Tech. This is a program that's going to be pretty good eventually. And I know they probably have aspirations of uh, FBS at some point. Um, you know, it's not far from southern Utah. It's in the southern part of the state. Um, you know, a growing part of the part of the country there. So it's a program I think is on the rise. You know, they're in the, the WAC conference. And, um, you know, and certainly an offense coordinator like Greg Stevens is somebody who can come in and help them turn things around. There's no doubt about it. So, I mean, you have a lot of moving parts here now. Obviously, Coach Selfo probably – I just learned about this news from Coach Stevens within the last two or three days, I would imagine. Um, so he's trying to process this too and, you know, develop a situation where he wants to go out and, and evaluate the situation um, and uh, and determine what he wants to do. You know, does he want to take that role on um, as call and plays again? Does he want to look at his assistant coaches or does he want to go out and try to find uh, a guy who's called plays before? Because, you know, it's, it, you know, it, you know, it's it's tough to – calling offense is about as tough as it gets, I think. And, um, you know, to consistently do that and to draw up a game plan and have to feel the game and adjust throughout the game, um, that's that's very difficult to do. And so it's going to be learning on the fly for somebody who's never called plays before. But, hey, it happens. You know, everybody gets their first yeah. shot somewhere, and so it could be well, here. You remember, you remember, guys, you know, the last time Coach Stevens left, we turned it over to somebody who had never called plays, and it, it, it didn't go that disaster. Long. It was a disaster. So, well, um, I, you know, the first year you had Brian Bennett. You know, obviously, you know, but up a lot. The, the second year it, it it showed, no question about it. In twenty fifteen, well, I mean, it showed. Even Brian, what was Brian? Brian in twenty thirteen was like what a fifty eight percent completion pass. Yeah, sixty like per sixty percent from sixty to forty eight. Forty eight. Yeah. yeah, that that's yeah. that's showing right there. So, um, you know, uh, look, I mean, um, I think that Coach Shelford has brought on an identity offensively. And I think Coach Stevens has used that identity to create plays and game plans that have success for the program. So that identity is going to continue to stay. I think you're going to see situations where they want to be physical, they want to run the football, um, and they want to create opportunities uh, down the field for their wide receivers. And so that's going to continue to be there. But, I mean, you know, for anybody coming in new, um, it's a tough spot to face two FBSs, Probably the defending national, two-time defending national champion, um, Eastern Washington, uh, and then on the road at Tarleton. And South well, Dakota State is probably going to be the best team on the schedule next year. Well, let's face it; they'll be better than Tulane and Southern Miss. Well, and look, guys, you know the, the other thing is, um, you know, we've really built our identity as a program on the offensive side of the football. Now we've made strides the last couple of years defensively, but you know, this past year was probably the worst offense we've had since Coach Selfo and Coach Stevens have been together. I don't think it's probably – I mean, it, it, was, I mean, it was the worst Easily, offense. easily. It's not even debatable. I, I, don't think. I think we're still ranked like 60th in the country nationally. So – or no, no, I think 40th. I think we're at 40th in the, in the nation nationally. Um, so what I'm trying to say is offense is the around here. So there's a lot of schools that – I don't think there was another Southland Conference team that was in the top 100 on offense. Uh, this year, so we had the number one offense still in the in the uh, well. No, UIW had to be UIW had to be. But but I guess my point is it, this year uh, was certainly a step back. But we've built this on identity because we've had a lot of consistency on the offensive side of the football with Greg and AJ Hop as the offensive line coach. So yeah. now this is a big shakeup. I mean, things are going to look different. And and let's just talk about the the realistic situation now with the new ruling and everything else. You might have guys that just signed in just, you know a couple of days ago. They get back in the portal now because of Coach Stevens' departure. Well, I don't so think that, they can uh, right now because you know they have to have a one-year residency with a letter of intent. So oh, the, you're right. The but guys maybe, who just signed, guys that are, 
there may be guys that are here now who who were sticking around, but they might get in the you know. Uh, what does Eli Sawyer do? Does he get in the portal? Does he well, stick around? I mean, you never know until you know next fall. I mean, you, you don't know who's going to be on your team, and that, that's everywhere. I, I think, and that, that's the problem with college football these days is you have no idea who's on your team. They can, as a matter of fact, you can go get transfers, bring them in, and they commit to you, and then they're here, and all of a sudden they look around. Ah, I think I'll go back in. You can go, you can jump in, jump out. I mean, there are no rules anymore. Uh, it's uh, it's a wild wild west. It's not a good situation, and you know it's it's really tough for FCS programs, especially like Southeastern, that don't have uh, a cost of attendance uh, situation, that don't have NIL, that that have nothing to offer basically other than Hammond America and a good chance to get a good education, you know, and to play in a in a good FCS program. But you know, again, you're battling so many different forces that you know. Uh, it, it, player retention, player development is, it's just not, I don't know. It's a wild, wild west. Hey, hey guys, I, I want to just clear this up. I, I just looked, I just looked it up. I just looked it up. We were 38th in off this year. Yeah, as bad you? as it seems, we were 38th in offense. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't another, there wasn't another team that was in the top 50 in the, uh, in the Southland. And of course, you know, a lot of that was, Kind of who you played down the stretch. I mean, you, you had some big you know, explosive games against uh, Commerce, Northwestern State, McNeese late in the year, which helped those numbers dramatically. Um, but, you know, this year was a situation you just turned the football over. You didn't have any explosiveness at wide receiver. Offensive line played subpar. Um, I mean, you had a lot of things. I think there was just a lot of. Weren't very good at running back. Uh, you, you weren't very good. I mean, there was a lot of things going on, I think you know, maybe behind the scenes and, and, and the whole deal. But uh, the bottom line is it just wasn't a good fit. I think you had oil and water going on, and it just uh, made for a mess. Yeah. So, I mean, um, well, we sit here right now, and look, I think people's jaw dropped when it was brought up last. I think I think Coach Selfo brought it up kind of in the pre-camp season about, like, uh, you know, hey, we didn't lose any assistance from our team last year, which is at this level of football is almost unheard of. Um, so you, you knew you weren't going to go two seasons with that in, in, in FCS football. Uh, we don't know of any other coaches that I've heard that have left, um, but there could still be one or two more. We'll see. We certainly hope not if we're happy with who we have. But uh, he is the first domino to fall since uh, the 2021 offseason. Um, you know, and look, the Southeastern struggle since 2018 has been defensively. They've been – very below average on defense. I think last year was probably our best defensive season that we faced and that we've had. Um, but I, I don't even know what we ranked defensively in the country. Alan, if you're looking that up, maybe you could tell us, but um, probably not. Always as had good. That off huh? Well, the defensive ranking probably wasn't as good just because when you get up North, everybody plays good defense because nobody plays good offense. Yeah. <laughs> Down well, here, it's an offensive league. You know, if it wasn't for incredible offensive output, um, in really 2020, 2021, and uh, and at times 2022, uh, the, the team would have really struggled. So it, the team has relied on offense over the last uh, seven years. There's no doubt about it. And Nin um, 94. 94. So we were 30 years ago. 30, I mean, 30, and if you go back to – if you look at the 2020 season or 2021 spring and you look at the, the, the fall of 2021, I bet the offense was ranked – now, you know, now, hold on, and I want to pause one thing. Other thing too is, uh, and those numbers are a little skewed as well, because not everybody's playing two FBS, right? You and, know what I mean. And, and so, Eastern Washington, who a prolific yeah. offense, played on the road early. But, but it's also, but it's also skewed the other way offensively, because you're not going to be as good, you know, against Mississippi State as you're going to be against. But, but I, guess, I guess the <laughs> the the thing is ranking fortieth offensively in the Southland Conference is not a good number. Ranking yeah, UIW 90, is second in the country. Right. Ranking 94th on defense was actually not bad <laughs> in the South, in the in the confines of the Southland Conference. In other words, we were better. We were I, I think anybody would say we were a better defensive football team than we're an offensive football team. Even though our numbers, if you just look at it from a national perspective, doesn't show that. Well we we played some awful teams. The Southern Conference was awful. And yeah. so we played some really it was awful. It's as bad as it's ever been. There's no question. And I mean, hopefully that changes. But, you know, this year was, you know, was Tarleton, really Tarleton was Tarleton was a bad offense, at least that day, 
when they played us. I think that had a little bit to do with how our defense played. But if you look at um, Lamar, wasn't very. I mean, I mean, look, Nichols got destroyed in the playoffs. I mean, well, destroyed. They couldn't even move the ball. So um, I'll put it to you like this: um, you can take any team before this year back to you know, probably 2010, 2011, would have won the Southland Conference this year. Any Southeast, you take any one of them. 2018 would have won this year. Would have won the league this year. No no doubt about it. The 28, 2018 football team, hands down, wins the Southland Conference in 2023, in my opinion. Maybe not 2015. 20, I, no, I think they would have. I think 2015 would have won. And this year, who, who would have beat them? That team, that team <laughs> was really good on defense. There's nobody in this. I think Mark... Good. I think Mark made some good points, Robbie. This was a awful. This was oh, as bad a Southland conference as I've ever seen. Nobody was good. <laughs> I mean, nobody. I was reading stuff. I was reading stuff before the Nichols uh, Southern Illinois game. Like, oh, Nichols has a chance in this one. I said, no, they have no chance, zero chance. <laughs> Nichols finishes yeah. last in any season. The, the, their Nichols team this year finishes last. Last year, the year before, <laughs> year before that, no chance. It was, it was awesome. I, I don't think people understand how bad McNeese was and how bad Northwestern was and how bad Commerce was. I mean, those and, were. And it hit like a ton of bricks. I'll, I'll tell you, it shocked me. I mean, it really did. I mean, you know, UIW I watched was. Cornell, I watched Cornell play in the D3 national title. They would have destroyed most of the Southland Conference. Cortland. Cortland. Cortland, excuse yeah. me. Cortland. They would have destroyed most. Well, of you had UIW <laughs> fans <laughs> complaining about not getting in the playoffs, and and I mean, like, did you flip on the tape? I mean, did you watch them play? I mean, that's it was uh, not getting the playoffs. They were nine and two, and they weren't even close. <laughs> no, no. I mean, they were they were one of the they weren't even one of the last four teams in the thing. You know, so you know, I mean, uh, I, you know, again, it, it, that that's that was a disappointing part of this year, and, and again, it was across the board. It was everybody. So I think it was. And, and Southland again, needs to the Southland needs to start worrying about football and getting that back to where it is, rather than just loving Will Wade and McNeese basketball on Twitter every night. Because that's literally, I mean, I look at the I, Southland Twitter and it's like, oh, the, the bandits, they are bandits because he's a bandit. But I, they that that is that that's that, that league needs to refocus <laughs> because I mean, I, I just can't stop watching this drool fest of Will Wade and his group over there at McNeese and 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 how bad football was. We need to refocus the attention to making every sport top-notch. Robbie Rhodes bringing the heat on a Friday night on, a, on well, the, the pod. The tweets are embarrassing. It's, it's Robbie, embarrassing. Hey, it's like – I mean, he's beat Michigan tonight. <laughs> it's embarrassing. The Southland Conference on Twitter with him is totally embarrassing. You know, it's, it's okay to promote programs, but, I mean – there's been huge wins in the South and before Southeastern maybe he's beating a bad Michigan team this year. I mean, they, they tweeted like nine times about that game. I, I don't, I don't get it, but that's, a whole I got, I got, I got no comment on what's going on over there. Well, thanks Mark. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> <I> mean... <laughs> glad, glad to be back on the, on the pod here tonight. Yeah. Glad to have you on the late night I, pod. I, with no, the, this uh, is we got to have stuff like this happen more often to get you back on. Well, a while. I mean, well, let's, you know, I mean, look, uh, you know, I'm as green and gold as they come. And, uh, but, you know, you got a family but, and you've got a business. But, 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 but not that. Look, this was, this is big news tonight. I mean, this is, yeah. this is big, big news. I mean, this is. Well, I know it hits you, especially hard because, I mean, you've been close to Greg and his family and, and, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, all of us. I mean, it's, he's been a big part of the Southeastern community and, and successful, and I, so it's it is big news. Look, I th I think I'm. Uh, it's weird because like uh, I know why he left probably in terms of family and wanting to get closer to home, but I would have been less shocked if you were putting me at what's say January 29th or December 29th, 2021, or even last year, and say Coach Stevens has left. I mean, what and the offense had Southern Miss or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean what the, what the offense has done. Um, you know, and look, folks, don't be surprised if in, you know, four or five years or less, if Ron Robert gets a job in the SEC, if Greg Stevens is not heading to wherever he is to be his offensive coordinator in the uh, Southeastern Conference. So that would, I mean, would that shock you guys one bit? No. Maybe not, maybe not OC right off the bat, but maybe a position coach or something. I mean, 
you know, they've been real close a long time. Well, you know, coaching's familiarity. I mean, you go with guys you know, and and obviously, you know, that's a a match that's been successful at multiple stops. Delta State here, and and um, you know, he rehired Greg when he, you know, before he left to go to uh, ULF. He had to take the defense coordinator's job, but um, you know, again, you know, it is what it is, um, and just to see yeah, how no, we, we move on and. Uh, yeah. See if we can. I mean, you know. phone, like you said, Mark. He knows people. He knows what he wants, and uh, I think he'll, you know, evaluate from within a little bit. But I really think, at the end of the day, if I had to guess what he's going to do, looking at the current, you know, uh, coaching assistant pool offensively here at Southeastern, I would imagine he's probably going to go out and look for. Uh, I mean, he's going to he's going to he's going to evaluate everybody, but I think he'll have a search to look at some outside options for offensive coordinator. I don't think it's going to be this given thing where it's like, hey. Uh, we're going to make so and so the office coordinators move forward. I think he'll take a look out there, see what's out there. Some new young, fresh coaches in there uh, who have called plays uh, that he might want to look at, or he might just make the decision. I see that happening first. The second thing I see happening is him calling the plays offensively and maybe elevating someone a title only on this offensive staff. But uh, the third, I don't, I don't see him bringing up anybody on the current staff where it sits right now. And just in my opinion, I think it's outside this program, then I think it's him. And then I think if, if he didn't want to go that route, that, that'd be my third choice. And I think in terms of what's going to happen, I mean, I would be shocked if he doesn't look outside, but again, he's got to be comfortable. And if he can't find anybody he's comfortable with, and he's comfortable with somebody on the staff or whether it's him, I mean, that's what he's got to do and, 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 and run with it and just see how, how it goes. But, you know, again, I, I think this program is in a situation, him, him going into year seven, you know, with, skins on the wall and trying to get back to, you know, prominence in the Southland conference, back to the playoffs. I think you've got to make a, this is a critical hire, no question about it, especially given the schedule that is laid out in front of you, uh, especially to begin to, you know, I think you can get through the conference next year pretty well, but we saw what happened this year when we got off to a bad start. I mean, you just couldn't recover. I mean, you were, it, it was almost like the, 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 the pre-conference schedule doomed the start of the Southland Conference. If well, you know Mark, I, think I, mean. you said, I think you said it best, Mark. Like if we'd have flipped schedules, conference schedules with Nichols, with Nichols we win the. I think we win the league. We go to the playoffs, and they're probably sitting at home. I, that's what I think would have happened. But, but, but you know, another thing about this though is, and we know how college football is, and we know how fan bases are. You know, it doesn't matter how much success you have. You know, you have a bad one like you had this year. You have a bad one like next year. I mean, if I'm not saying we're going to have a bad one. I'm just saying if if you would not uh, have a great year next year, you know, it starts, it starts you know, uh, people start to get Nancy a little bit. But to have a great year, you're going to have to knock off at least one of Tulane Southern Miss, uh, Eastern Washington, and, and South Dakota State. You're going to have to at least split those games. Tarleton. And Tarleton going into conference play. You've got to come out of that three and two going in the conference play to avoid, you know, just Ooh, the, negative, the negativity. No, I, 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 is it, I don't think, think it's impossible. Three. I think you well, go two and three. Two and three at worst. But I think if you're one and four, oh, and five, uh, that's that's going to be tough. I mean, you look Yeah, there's going to be a lot of – be tough for the players if you start oh, and five after this season. Um, you know, because uh, there's a lot of outside noise that starts coming into play if you start oh, and five after – uh, this season, which may not be merited. Look, I mean, I've, I've, I've spoken um, this, these last two, yeah, the, the schedules the last two years have not been put well together. Um, I know you want to go out there and play anybody, but you have to be more thorough and thought out. Like you, you just can't, if you, if you have to put two FBSs on your schedule, you can't just schedule three juggernauts outside well, of that. Well, there's well, a South reason. South Dakota State's better than those, than those two FBSs. They're the best team on our schedule next year. By far, they're the best team on the schedule this year. They're playing three FCS, FBS. Yeah, they, really, it is. They will be the best team we've played the last how many years? I mean, probably better than anything we've played in the last five, six years. I don't know. They're playing better than Mississippi State. I mean, oh, they're, but they're close. They're better than Mississippi State. Oh. Allen, they'll destroy Mississippi State. I'm just telling you. South Dakota State. And, and, they're, and they're, losing, they're losing like 18 seniors this year, too. So, uh, 30. Well, no, they're lo- no, they're only losing half of them. Half of them are coming back because they're they're they have thirty. They have the uh, eighteen COVID seniors. They got they're coming back. They, they may jump in the portal, but 
but uh, I think a lot of them said they, they're coming back. Well, that'll do it, guys. We'll keep our eyes peeled on this as we go through the uh, the next few weeks to see what Coach uh, Greg, uh, uh, Frank Southern wants to, to to do with the offensive coordinator position. But as we have mentioned here today, offensive coordinator Greg Stevens has made the jump to Utah Tech to be the team's offensive coordinator for the 2024 season. So, um, you know, Mark, your final thoughts. Well, I, you know, I think we wish Greg Stevens the best going back home to his uh, home state of Utah, and I think he'll do well there. And it's, like I said, a big win for the Utah Tech Blazers, but it's a chance for, you know, a, a new birth for Southeastern, uh, no question, a chance yep. for to, to put a new stamp on things and to revitalize this offense. And I have faith in Frank Selfo that he'll go out and make a good hire and, and get this thing turned around. I mean, it will be a daunting task next year. We talked about it, but I'm, I'm an optimist, and I feel like, you know, they've signed a good recruiting class. I think they've got some guys that will be able to step in and, and help. And I think they'll do some, hopefully, do some things in the portal to kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, build this uh, roster back up to compete. But you know, again, the challenges are there. Uh, we know what they are, and we'll just see what happens. But uh, you know, again, it's 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 college football, and staffs change all the time, and it's it's not unheard of, and it happens all the time, and it's not something we shouldn't expect. It's just when it's a guy that. Uh, you know, well, has been successful. It, it uh, warrants a little special comment here tonight. Alan, yeah, well, look, I want to I want to give Coach Selfo a lot of credit. Looking back at this at this situation, because what what a lot of people uh, in Lion Nation probably don't remember is that Greg Stevens was a finalist to get the head job when Frank Selfo was hired. That's a good point. And Coach Selfo, and Coach Selfo didn't know Greg from Adam, and they, you know, met a few times, and I know they were impressed with each other, and it ended up being an incredible marriage. Um, and I think that's what, obviously, whenever something like this, anytime change happens, you look at something, especially when it's a good thing, and you go, man, you know, that stinks. Because they, you know, the last five years or six, what is it, six years? Last six years, we have seen some of the most incredible offense that we've that anybody has seen in the country. I mean, it has been – your price of admission to get into Strawberry Stadium has been well worth it because you have seen offensive football like nobody else has seen in college football at any level. And um, so, look, wish the very best to Greg Stevens, his family. Uh, I know that I do know deep down that they've got to be, you know, happy to be going back out west to Utah, which are there to where they're from. And I'm sure it's bittersweet for him, though, as well, because I know that they love the Hammond community as well. So, Greg, uh, you know, if you're watching this, you know, thanks for everything you did here in Hammond. And uh, and look forward to what the future holds now for Southie. Uh, I do think this is a critical hire uh, to keep this offensive train rolling here in Hammond. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Uh, Late Night Pod jumping on here talking about this breaking news in Southeastern Louisiana University. I'm supporting Greg Stevens heading to Utah Tech. Uh, for Mark Willoughby and Alan Waddell, I wish everyone a happy new year, and we'll talk to you in 2024. We'll see where this goes. Guys, good job tonight. Line up. Line up.